These two sailboats look a lot alike. This is the Antrim 27, and this is the Ultima 20. It's not too surprising that they look similar, because Jim Antrim, who designed this boat, also designed this boat. They both have mainsails. They both have asymmetrical spinnakers out the front here to give extra drive. Both of them have bow sprits to support the asymmetrical spinnaker. And the general shape of the boat looks pretty similar, at least from these pictures. If we look down here and look at the pictures down below in profile, again, they look very similar in shape and general layout. So how would we compare these two boats, besides noticing that one of them is longer, about 28 feet long, compared to about 21 feet long for the smaller Ultima 20? So what else would you compare? I'm interested in these boats because I've sailed on one of these Antrim 27s, and this Ultima 20, that guy in the back there, that's me. The boats look a lot alike. They're very similar in shape, but how do we tell if they match? We could compare the length ratios, about 28 feet to about 21 feet, gives us about one and a third in terms of scaling up the size. If they scaled up by that one and a third factor, we'd expect the width ratio to also be one and a third. But in fact, we compare the numbers that we had and we get 1.1. That tells us that the Ultima 20 is proportionately wider than the Antrim 27, so the shapes aren't quite the same. The sail area ratio, if we compare the number of square meters of sail that each of them have got, we get a ratio of about 1.6. Now, that seems much larger than 1.34, but remember, this is scaling a length dimension. And if everything was the same size by scale, then the sail area would scale up as the length squared. So 1.3 times 1.3? That's not far off a direct scale up. And the dimensions, if we compare a variety of dimensions on the linear size of the sails, we get about 1.27. So that's scaling up pretty similarly in terms of shape. The ballast ratio? Well, the Antrim 27 has about two and a third times as much ballast, as much keel weight as the Ultima 20. The Ultima 20 is a much lighter boat. And does that scale? Well, we'd expect it to scale sort of as the length cubed. If we just made everything bigger, then the volume of that keel, that piece of lead, is going to be about 1.3 times 1.3 times 1.3. That gets us up towards 2.33. And the keel dimensions, the depth and length of the keel, they wind up being about the same scale-up ratio. So these are two very similar boats. The message from all of that is that internal length ratios really do define the geometry. Once we have a single length scale for a boat, for example, the overall length of the boat, then if two boats are exactly the same shape, then all of the other ratios will scale accordingly. So we could then produce a dimensionless group from two of those length scales, say the beam to length ratio. It's dimensionless, and it tells us something about how wide the boat is compared to how long it is. On the Ultima 20, that's uh, 8 and a third feet over about 21 feet. And that's about 0.4. It's about 40% as wide as it is long. That's a pretty wide boat, especially for a sailboat. And this is an obvious way to make static geometric comparisons. If we don't get all of these length ratios to match up, then the boat isn't of similar geometry. Not exactly alike geometry anyway. We can also look at other uh, measurements. One of the common ones that's used is sail area to displacement ratio. And that tells us something about how tippy the boat is, how readily it heals over. And the idea is that the more sail area and the lighter the boat, the more easily it will tip over or heel over in the wind. And it's defined as the sail area divided by the volume to the two-thirds power. That's dimensionless, and it relates the sail force to the weight of the boat, but it doesn't have all of the information that we need in order to determine if two boats are actually geometrically similar but it allows us to have a basis for comparing a couple of boats to know how much they how much power they have in the sail compared to the size of the boat
42, which is the number that we wind up with for the ultimate 20, means a lot of sale area for the size. How does this actually work out? What's the logic behind getting to that sale area to displacement ratio? Well, if we wanted to know how much the boat was going to heel over, how tippy it was, we could compare the heeling moment and the righting moment. That is, the force or the, the uh, moment that's going to tend to roll the boat over and the moment that's going to tend to get it to stay standing upright. So the sail is what's going to tip it over. So if we knew what the forces were on the sail and the average distance above the uh, area of rotation that those forces were applied, that would give us a moment. So force times distance gives us a moment of the sail. That's going to tend to tip the boat over. Then we could look at the force times the uh, uh, moment arm for the ballast, and that's going to be the gravity force on the keel that's tending to pull the boat back upright. And the deeper the keel is, the more uh, readily it's going to pull the boat back upright. So definitely these two lever arms are important. How high up the mast is will determine how much uh, uh, how far up the moment arm the sail is, and how deep the keel is will tell us the moment arm for the ballast. The sail force will have something to do with a lift coefficient on the sail, and the density of the air, the wind velocity squared, the area of the sail, all divided by two. And that's something that we'll see uh, a little later on in looking at lift and drag coefficients. The uh, effect of the uh, ballast will depend on uh, something about the density of the water and the volume of the ballast. So we've got, if we drop a bunch of these constants just to get a proportionality, the taller the mast and the bigger the sail area, the more the boat's going to tend to tip over, heel over. The deeper the keel and the bigger and heavier it is, the more it's going to tend to pull the boat upright. And if we look at that, that's not too far off from that area over volume to the two-thirds number. But what's going on here? How did we get from V to V to the two-thirds? Well, if this moment arm for the sail tended to increase with the length of the boat, and this moment arm for the ballast tended to remain about the same. That would mean the mast got taller while the keel didn't get much deeper, and that usually happens. Then we'd have a length scale up here that was increasing, and we'd have length cubed down here. That gets us to length squared, or volume to the two-thirds. And this dimensionless group turns out to be a really good comparator for a whole collection of different boats for a whole collection of different reasons. And so applying dimensional analysis is partly a science approach, but it's also very much an art approach in terms of making these approximations to find a dimensionless group that actually captures the information that we're looking for. Dimensionless ratios are tricky to select. They need to be dimensionless, otherwise we're going to wind up with a whole lot of complications around units. They need to capture the physics that are important to us. For instance, in the boats, they, uh, with the displacement ratio, sail area to displacement ratio, they were capturing some of the physics of the tippiness of the boat. Length ratios, if we get all the length ratios right, then we'll capture the geometry. And we should be able to sum up the overall size of our, our system, whether it's a boat or a pipe or, or an aircraft, with one length scale, uh, dominant length scale, for the particular case. If we then look at force ratios, we can capture some dynamic effects. Those force ratios, like that sail area to displacement ratio, tell us something about how our system's going to behave, which forces are more important, which ones are larger compared to others. And those force ratios are going to be especially interesting when we compare them to fluid inertia. Because if the fluid's in motion, we're always going to have fluid inertia. And we'd like to know how large an effect different types of forces are going to have on that inertia. 
And we can measure that effect by taking, for instance, the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces, or the inertial forces to gravity forces, or the inertial forces to pressure forces. And we're going to take that approach a little later to try to come up with some dimensionless groups that are going to turn out to be really important in fluid mechanics and any other area where we're looking at variations in fluid flow, particularly heat transfer.